Cool. So welcome, everyone. Good morning. For those who wake up, if you didn't wake up, I will try to wake you up with Terraform. I don't know how it works, but we'll try. So thanks. OK, my name is Anton Babienka, and uh, quite recently I was uh, recognized as AWS Community Hero because I do pretty many different activities related to Terraform and AWS. So AWS decided to award me. So I also organize a bunch of different user groups here in Norway and in Oslo, HashiCorp user groups, uh, AWS user groups, DevOps Norway, and also conference uh, DevOps Days Oslo. But uh, for the last uh, four years, I've been uh, spending pretty much uh, daily at some point uh, enormous amount of time to contribute to different Terraform AWS projects. Some of them listed here, and some of them I will be uh, covering in more details. Uh, in particular, you can always uh, ask me uh, on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, or email uh, if you have any questions about the talk or about Terraform or AWS. I really like to answer them. So what I do, obviously uh, Terraform is hot, everybody wants to use it, so I write a lot of open source projects which turn out to be paying me nothing. Okay, So that's why I provide consulting, workshops, mentorship, and more traditional set of services. Because it's pretty hard to get rich from just writing open source code, which actually some of you room, uh, in this room are actually using. So I'm glad for that. For, for uh, T to begin with, uh, in about 2015, I started writing different Terraform uh, AWS modules, uh, figure out what is it, how to use them, and then I uh, published many of them, and then they become actually quite popular. Uh, most of them are verified by HashiCorp, and they get uh, stamped, and actually more than 4 million uh, of downloads for the last two years. So a lot of people uh, need to use them uh, and use them if they want to build uh, infrastructure on AWS. Like if you need to set up VPC or auto scaling group, uh, it's very hard to be really unique and you just have to use something existing. Like in general programming language, we've been using the libraries, right? So that's, uh, uh, that's what Terraform AWS modules. Another product which I'm affiliated with is uh, Cloudcraft. It is uh, the best way to draw AWS diagrams for your project, where you can visualize all of your infrastructure uh, in the browser, and uh, you can connect them, you can specify different properties, you can actually import live AWS infrastructure, you can see budget, you can embed it into your Confluence wiki, you can export this image, and uh, many, many different things. But you may think, like, why Cloudcraft? Okay, Cloudcraft is probably uh, not developer friendly because it's all in the browser. And uh, I'm here to emphasize the value of infrastructure as code using Terraform. Okay, so infrastructure as code makes DevOps possible because uh, only if we write something as a code, then we can actually treat it uh, similar as we do with application code. We always know what has changed, who has changed, maybe even why they change it. And we can also validate uh, different infrastructure changes uh, as we do with application code in pipeline. Before deployment on production, we can deploy the same change in test environment, see how it behaves, and so on. So Terraform. Uh, who knows what is Terraform or who uses Terraform? Like, OK, so less than half of people uh, raise hand. Some people raise hand under the desk, which still count. Uh, so I guess. Uh, Many of you know what is Terraform. Okay, so Terraform, uh, in nutshell, uh, started in 2014 as a tool to create, update, and uh, change infrastructure uh, safely and uh, in predictable way, so that we always know what's going to change. We don't want to have different surprises. So this is how a typical configuration uh, file in Terraform looks like. Uh, I'm talking about Terraform 011, which was uh, uh, created for quite some time. 012 was released uh, three weeks ago. There is very little difference, but I will highlight them during talk as well. So this is how a uh, configuration file looks like. It is text file where we specify variable which we want to use, and we specify what kind of resource we want to make. And uh, then we run several commands to download dependencies. Uh, Terraform init will download dependencies required to talk to different cloud providers, like in this case, AWS. 
and then I run Terraform apply in order to see what's going to happen. So in this case, uh, I want to create bucket uh, with random name, so that's what it tells. I confirm this with yes, that that's exactly what I want, and then after six seconds, uh, my bucket called uh, my bucket C snail is created. That's all what, it, what we have. So we create text file, we declare what we want, and we run Terraform commands to get these resources created. You may think that uh, AWS has CloudFormation, Google has Google Cloud Deployment Manager, and Azure, of course, said that uh, there is nothing else better than JSON, so here is Azure Resource Manager. And uh, uh, why uh, these providers uh, create this? They wanted to uh, uh, let users to manage the infrastructure on that provider. So there is almost no way, uh, no easy way to combine resources between these providers. And then Terraform appeared and said, okay, no problem. We have more than 100 more providers in addition to these three. So that's, that's pretty good, right? So you may think that, okay, we have uh, support for all of these providers, which we can easily combine and declare in the same syntax. So we are using the same language. We don't have to mix Python for Google Cloud, uh, and YAML or JSON for CloudFormation or Azure Resource Manager. We all define in a language which is called HCL, which is short form for HashiCorp configuration language. So that's really good that we don't need to know all of this and try to come up with all of these things. But in addition to this, uh, Terraform was designed uh, to be used, uh, uh, to be reused. So there are uh, lots of different concepts in Terraform built in, which allows us to write small amount of code and reuse it across different projects, different solutions. So that's, that's really a, a differentiator. And uh, back in 2014, for those who don't remember what was the time, uh, all of these tools uh, like CloudFormation, Azure, Google Deployment Manager, you uh, just execute your script, your fingers crossed, and you hope that nothing is destroyed. Okay, that's, uh, this mode is called finger crossed. With Terraform, this was taken very seriously. And there are concepts uh, like uh, Terraform state file, where we know that there is a known, uh, known collection of, uh, or known, um, uh, specification, no, no description of resources which we already manage with Terraform. So we can always compare what's going to happen and we don't have to uh, uh, turn on fingers cross mode every time. We see what's going to happen, uh, we confirm that this is exactly what we want and we apply this change. Back in 2014 it was uh, one of the best uh, uh, benefit which you can tell to anybody and they will say, oh my god, I'm going to use Terraform immediately. I remember this uh, time myself. When I showed it to some of my customers, they say like, oh my God, I abandoned CloudFormation from right now. And yeah, since they're, they're happy users of Terraform. <laughs> so uh, Terraform is actually a universal tool. As long as there is an API, it means that uh, there is a way to uh, instruct Terraform to manage resources on any other providers. For example, uh, if you want to order pizza, I mean, yes, Domino has an API, so you just specify size of pizza, uh, what kind of stuff to put there, you specify your credit card details, and then API call will be made by Terraform to Domino Pizza, and eventually your pizza will be delivered. It's nice, I think, right? I mean, isn't it what Terraform for? <laughs> Actually, uh, Minecraft is what is it for. I mean, uh, Minecraft also has an API. So in Minecraft, you can specify uh, in position what type of object you want to place on X, Y, Z coordinates. And uh, you can also specify dependencies that you can say, first build uh, this plate and then put sheep on top of it. So there will be specif uh, Terraform will handle dependencies in order to figure out in which sequence to build these objects. Again, this is an example of API. More uh, traditional, of course, it's uh, public cloud like AWS, which uh, takes, I guess, about 70% of all uh, attention to Terraform, and uh, many other providers like uh, community developed by, um, for example, Dropbox, or uh, to manage your Google applications or Gmail accounts, you can create issues with Terraform, and so on. So many different providers uh, exist. 
uh, right now I think there are about 170 or about 190 different providers by community. So let's start with something more real, okay? Because not everybody is playing Minecraft, not everybody ordering pizza on Domino, though I order it. Okay, so let's manage AWS network stack. This is uh, getting to be a little bit more advanced and maybe, uh, oh, actually I forgot to mention, this is going to be advanced talk, okay? It's not going to be about ordering pizza and Minecraft anymore. So let's uh, deep dive into some more Terraform specifics. So this is how uh, we want to create VPC. We specify a Cedar block and we uh, run Terraform commands and then we'll get Cedar blocks allocated for this VPC. Then we extend this, this uh, text file and we want to have internet access. So we specify that now we want to add internet gateway and we tell for which VPC. That's easy. Then we add subnets, okay, well, because obviously we need to put some resources. So we specify a couple more resources. And then we are uh, going to add some more resources like routing table, route table association, rules, uh, not gateways, elastic IP address, and so on. So for very small and for pretty, um, pretty simple network stack on almost any uh, project, uh, this network configuration uh, file will contain two to 300 lines easily. So it's, it's not a lot, but it's not something what uh, is a differentiator for your business, most likely. So there will be a lot of files and a lot of lines, sorry. And uh, as we can see, the amount of code is always increasing and the complexity is going to be increasing as well. So VPC, Internet Gateway, subnets, all of them are dependent to each other and uh, it will be pretty tricky to manage this. So the first uh, thing which Terraform uh, came up out of the box back in long, long time ago was Terraform modules. So Terraform modules are just self-contained packages of Terraform file which we always call as a single unit. So that's the only thing which you need to know about Terraform modules uh, when you think about them. So th there are two types of modules. One is uh, called resource modules, uh, in particular those which I maintain on the Terraform AWS modules GitHub account. And there are um, another type of module which is called uh, infrastructure modules. So let's look into more details about uh, first group. Resource modules uh, are designed to be uh, extremely flexible and uh, they handle all of the complexity inside of it and they are not containing any business logic. They don't have any opinions. They just let you do whatever is possible with this resource. So they're a great candidate to be open source and the majority of modules which you find in open source, uh, I mean in the public, they are exactly resource modules. So resource modules in Terraform can be invoked like this. First, we specify from which place we want to call it. In this case, we specify that we want to use uh, HTTPS submodule from security group module. We specify which version we want to get, and we specify different attributes or arguments which we want to pass to that module. So that's easy. In this case, we are calling module, and we want to open to have security group with just HTTPS port open. So first question to people, especially for those who use Terraform. So would you use Terraform module to manage uh, AWS EC2 security group? Or would you just write the resource in two resources like security group and attach a bunch of different rules to it? So the question is, would you use Terraform module to manage AWS EC2 uh, security group? Nobody raising hands means that nobody would use it, right? Okay, that's good watch this movie. <coughs> and so on. So this is a real uh, logic which you will have to implement if you want to create security group yourself uh, on AWS. Uh, there are about uh, 600 or 800 lines in order to create security group in really flexible configuration. When I say flexible, then it means that you as a user of uh, AWS, you seldomly think about what is actually inside of Terraform, AWS provider, AWS SDK, AWS 
uh, internals, you are abstracted away from all of this. And that's the purpose of uh, resource modules, is that you don't have to know internal implementation of uh, how to create IPv6 rules, IPv4, prefix list, self-references, all protocols, name group, and, uh, yeah, and something else. Uh, all of this is handled by these resource modules, which uh, you don't have to uh, know and you, ha you don't have to make this yourself in order to use it. So the abstraction here is a key, that uh, you don't have to uh, know all of details in order to use it. So think about this as a benefit of resource modules in first place. And second type of module is infrastructure module which is obviously consisting of some resource modules because you don't want to deal with internals. And this is often the place for your company to implement uh, all uh, standards which you have in company, like naming, security, encryption, uh, and other things which uh, are relevant for your industry or for your company specifically. And uh, back in 2015 uh, uh, or and to 17, or actually right up until now, uh, it is the only place where you can use different kind of preprocessors like JSONnet, cookie cutter to generate code for your module uh, and let other people in your organization to use it. The invocation of infrastructure module is very similar. We specify where we want it to get and then we specify different uh, arguments which we want to pass. Inside of the module, uh, we can see that we are just invoking different uh, versions of uh, different modules. So we say that we want to make VPC by invoking this module and application load balancer and so on. So it's, it's no different. There is no big difference between resource and infrastructure module. So let's talk about what to do and what not to do with Terraform modules. Uh, one of the uh, frequent problem is that uh, when you start writing module, you are trying to solve just your use case. And if you are uh, working alone in entire isolation, you will never care about anyone else. But it's unlikely and most likely you have some other team, some other colleague, somebody else who wants or who should uh, not reinvent the same solution which you came up with. So that's an important point to write code which other people can use even in your organization. So the first uh, uh, evil part uh, in modules, which uh, I see quite often, is that people put provider blocks and they assume that everybody will be using uh, this module just in this configuration. This is a pretty bad idea because it's not possible to inherit and override provider blocks um, so easily with Terraform. So never put this uh, inside of your module itself. Always. Uh, think about this as a layer and put provider's configuration as high as possible where it makes sense. Um, so second uh, evil part is uh, provisioner. Provisioner is uh, something what allows you to execute different shell script or CLI, uh, like AWS CLI, uh, after resource has been created. In this case, uh, uh, we are tightly, uh, we are cu tightly coupling uh, AWS uh, VPC resource uh, together with provisioner, which is a pretty bad idea. Uh, it is bad because it's not possible to extend or override this resource at all. So just try to not put this resource, uh, this section uh, at all in your files and always use something outside of Terraform, which is Ansible, Puppet, or whatever else, what you can trigger after that, uh, after a resource is created. And uh, even if you think that, okay, uh, there is an instance and I will launch this instance and then I want to run Ansible playbook from my local machine and connect to this instance and do whatever I want, uh, it is often a bad idea because it's not possible to extend. And what is actually the problem part in provisioner here in instance, which many people don't uh, think about, is that at some point you will uh, think about, oh, now I want to make an uh, launch configuration and I want to uh, auto-scale my instance, even if I want to have minimum, maximum desired capacity to one. Uh, the thing is that it's not possible to use provisioners on launch configurations. So the solution here is that you use user data and uh, only when instance is launched, then the common pattern is that you actually download playbooks from S3 
and you execute them on machine locally once instance is up and running. So this is a common problem which uh, many people uh, don't realize unless they, they are told to implement auto scaling group. So at some point you may think that, okay, I actually need to extend uh, functionality of certain resources which are available in AWS SDK or AWS CLI. Uh, so I really want to use uh, my local machine. So null resource, a special type of resource, which is not actually uh, like resource because it's null resource. But uh, it is possible to say that once VPC is created, then actually run this uh, command which I want. So this way it is possible to uh, have uh, VPC creation and execution of AWS CLI independently. And uh, there are many different uh, points which I uh, highlighted uh, and I think they are pretty relevant if you want to write code in Terraform which is actually uh, useful. And uh, I ordered these points uh, by by this order because uh, I, I believe that documentation and example is the most important part. Not tests, uh, because I mean tests uh, are useless uh, because simply uh, first you have to know what this module is doing, uh, how to use it, what to expect from it. Uh, okay, does it have enough features which uh, I need right now? What kind of defaults does it have? Uh, is it opinionated and everything is hard-coded? Hopefully not. Does it create just resources which I want, or it also creates something what I really don't need? So this means clean code. And then at the end, yes, you may have some automation uh, regarding, uh, regarding this module where you can run example, you can verify that output of this uh, was ex as expected. And this is a pretty hot area where everybody thinks that they need tests. I don't believe that people need tests. Uh, unless they implement uh, at least four steps before that. So if you disagree, I would really like to talk to you about Terra Grant, AWS spec, InSpec, server spec, and um, any other tool which you know about this. Because uh, I kind of put it in this order and I'd like to know what you think about it. So, are Terraform modules enough? Unfortunately not, because uh, it is good start but it's not enough. Okay, so let's look into how to structure Terraform configurations and we will see more about, uh, more about how to call them. So uh, if we look into uh, how our project evolved, first we started with small main TA file, we put into different files, then we figure out that, okay, we, uh, we are doing something what is not actually differentiating, so we go to a place where other people publish uh, their modules and we find something there and we start using it. Okay, so now we, are, uh, we found VPC module, auto scaling group, RDS, so we have our own mess, okay? We will soon have mess. Now it's time to think about, okay, how to actually uh, orchestrate this, how to maybe separate this. So let's look into different patterns here. The first way, uh, uh, which is probably on the very left side, is called all-in-one. It's where we are just uh, uh, invoking all of these modules uh, one by one. So we specify all of these uh, modules after modules and it, it eventually gets bigger and bigger. And if next time when we run Terraform apply, it will take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then we'll think like, mm, yeah, it doesn't look so good. So maybe Terraform is bad. Maybe I have to move to something else. This is what people think. No, in fact, uh, you start with something what you probably have to evolve. And second way on the very far right is one-in-one, -one, is where we have very small blast radius, where we are just invoking a single module or small collection of modules. And we specify that uh, if I'm working on VPC, then I will not be able to affect anything else than just VPC. So I go to VPC folder, I work in that I isolation, and that's it. Uh, there is very small blast radius. That's the important part. And uh, let's uh, think about, especially those who use Terraform already, uh, which way do you group your code uh, at work? Like all-in-one or one-in-one? -one? So all-in-one is on one side and one-in-one -one is on the other side. Who is uh, thinking that all-in-one is what you 
have and what you probably like. Anyone? Right, but actually there are people, but you're just shy. Okay, but uh, one in one, uh, who think that this is good and this is what we should be using? Right, okay, so yeah, it's quite obvious that people think that, yeah, one in one looks good and I definitely have to use it. And uh, the correct things, or actually MFA, is that somewhere in between is true. Okay, because uh, most frequently, or at least when I'm speaking about myself, is when I wake up and I think like, oh, that's going to be an awesome project, I will make everything perfect from day one, no shortcuts, everything will be uh, ready in time. Uh, believe me, it's not happening like this. Okay, w I always start with one file, I put a bunch of different things, I experiment there, I connect different components, especially in situations which I never worked with before. It will be much faster for me to work in a big snowball of mass and try to connect different uh, resources uh, before I figure out different patterns and can uh, extrapolate it. Uh, one in one on another side is when I clearly know that this is a well-established project, it's not day one of the project, uh, I already know that, okay, we have some application, we have some load balancers, we have some VPC, and uh, what is really important is that if I'm not uh, working on this alone, uh, which means that there will be different type of people involved, uh, it's really beneficial to think about one and one or somewhere in that area. Uh, if I have created some code before, uh, for example, to set up um, similar infrastructure, one and one is very natural choice for me. So normally uh, one and one is something what people are aiming for but uh, they're always starting with all-in-one. I mean, occasionally people start uh, thinking about uh, like pre-optimization and trying to make everything perfect, but then they, you know, what's happening with uh, optimization in advance, right? It will kill the project. So, what about Terraform workspaces? Who think that Terraform workspaces is awesome? Okay, for those who don't know what is Terraform workspaces, let me tell that this is not awesome. Okay, Terraform Workspaces is not awesome. Terraform Workspaces was designed by HashiCorp. Uh, it became part of Terraform uh, because, uh, uh, because why not? I mean, people have uh, one folder and they want to execute the same code for, uh, for similar situations with slightly different variables. So, for example, I have project A and I want to have a very similar project but for project B which is very similar, but just a little bit different. Uh, I uh, honestly uh, believe, and I'm glad that many, many people support my vision, is that Terraform workspaces is the evil. There are two evil parts in Terraform, uh, which I really uh, like to highlight because I, I, I understand what I'm talking about. Terraform workspaces and provisioner. These two things which should never be used in any real projects. So never ever use them. The problem with workspace is uh, that we are not paying for disk storage. We are paying for code readability. So always copy-paste code, use some abstractions, uh, use something what uh, is very easy for human to understand. We are not writing code for computers anymore, right? We are not paying for two kilobytes saved of, uh, on my disk. So always uh, try to uh, write something what human will understand. And uh, documentation says uh, what is Terraform workspaces in much more details. So if you will read this documentation, you may have some idea that, oh yeah, that's actually what I need. But please uh, read it carefully. And uh, don't try to, uh, to use it unless you have a lot of money. Okay, it's paid feature. So solution, again, we already know what is module, so why not use the same module but just uh, uh, provide different arguments to it? So that's easy. Again, we are not paying for storage, we are paying for uh, support of this code. So Terraform 0.12 uh, has been released uh, three weeks ago. Uh, if you've been following this process for quite some time, uh, uh, Terraform 0.12 was announced uh, approximately a year ago, and a lot of people were expecting that it is going to be solving my, all of my needs with all of my code uh, because of all of cool features. It has simplified syntax where we don't have to write double quotes, dollar, curly brackets anymore. Isn't it nice? We can have loops, we can have dynamics blocks, we can have 
correct conditional operations where left and right parts are uh, executed not simultaneously. We can have extended types uh, like uh, list of maps of strings of maps of list of strings. Isn't it beautiful that we can have instead of just integer, uh, string, and boolean, we can have so nice complicated stuff. We can have templates and values, which is, I don't even have example <laughs> why, why you would need it. But uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of cool stuff was announced. And uh, I feel and uh, I believe myself is that it's going to be a pretty solid change to many, uh, to many projects and many companies where, uh, where they were using Terraform 0.11. And uh, what I want to uh, uh, to talk about is uh, uh, that not everything will be all right, okay? Because there are very uh, important points in Terraform uh, users' community. We have to think about different types of users. And when I say that uh, different types of users, I'm not saying that this is good and this is bad. I'm just uh, saying that uh, we cannot, like, to put it another way, uh, who knows what is full-stack developers? Right? I mean, probably everyone. So you know that uh, previously we had front-end, back-end. Let's combine them. Then uh, what else, what kind of skills we should inflate into full-stack developers in order for them to be still full-stack developer? Should they also know Terraform? Hopefully not. So there are Terraform developers who are uh, familiar with uh, how to write uh, Terraform modules, how to use different features of Terraform, how to use your public cloud of choice, how to implement uh, company standards, and they know these standards and they can implement them. They can maintain reference architecture for your company so that they really know, okay, we are dealing with uh, uh, microservices. This is how we deploy our microservice. This is how we manage uh, different resources related to microservices and they can make a reference architecture uh, for everybody to look into and to discuss. While on another side, there are 90% uh, of people who just want to get things done. And that's really important to understand, is that we cannot always uh, expect people, uh, let's say front-end developers, to, hey, please write awesome Terraform code. He will be able to do this. And, uh, I'm not saying that uh, front-end developer is, is bad by definition to, to work with Terraform, but I just don't want to, uh, to make HR process even more harder now that they have to look for full-stack developers with Terraform skills. I, I simply don't know anyone here in Oslo. I live in Oslo. So it's, it, it's just bad to, uh, to require everybody know Terraform and be domain expert, no JavaScript, no Python, no this, no that, on very high level. Uh, so what I'm saying is that Terraform users are those who can figure out which component they want to change, or they go to reference architecture and they figure out, okay, this is how we deal with microservices. So they call this service without deep understanding of how and why it was implemented this way. And they just specify correct values there. So they tell, okay, this is my uh, key value uh, or whatever type of uh, input this module accepts. And that's it. That's where they are the main experts. They know what type of stuff this module accepts and they provide it. Uh, the complexity is treated by Terraform developers who actually wrote these modules. So for Terraform uh, developers, uh, Terraform 0 012 has actually an enormous amount of features. So all of these uh, features which uh, were listed here uh, that's exactly what Terraform developers who develop modules were looking for. So yes, uh, we need uh, loops, we need dynamic blocks, we need all of these features in order to implement uh, and handle resource creation the way we want. So uh, I honestly was not able to write uh, modules for some very easy resources which you may think like, why, why not? For example, S3 bucket. In Terraform 0.11, I couldn't make it with less than 6,000 6, lines. In Terraform 0.12, it's 100 lines. So it's it's big difference. But the code, which uh, if you look into that, you will think that this is crazy. And that's something what I don't want uh, users to to deal with. So Terraform uh, 0.12 for users bring only one thing. 
it is that uh, they actually uh, see much easier syntax. So if they have to change something, it will be much easier for them to uh, to handle it. They don't have to know uh, crazy amount of interpolation functions and escaping and so on. It's uh, much more simplified. So that's the only benefit for them. As a summary, I want to say that uh, Yes, in, in fact, Terraform modules, they are definitely must-have. And uh, as, a, uh, as I said, uh, we cannot start with everything perfect, but we still have to reach to that, or we have to go to that direction where uh, one in one plus TerraGrant uh, is something what we should be aiming. TerraGrant is a uh, third-party tool uh, which allows to orchestrate invocation of infrastructure modules. So think about this as... Uh, something what you can call and uh, it will handle dependencies for you. So for example, dependency can be that uh, instance can be launched only after network is created. So you go to the folder and you run Terragram apply and then it goes through dependencies and figure out which one has to be created first and then it creates it. While having uh, one in one structure, it's very convenient and very easy to explain to people who are not uh, professional Terraform developers. And if you don't have lots of money, but you think that Terraform workspace is for you, uh, please copy paste files. It's much, much easier. And Terraform 012 is awesome, but unfortunately it's, uh, or not unfortunately, realistically, it's awesome uh, for developers, not for users. So uh, for me, this means that uh, I will be able to write even more modules and maintain them in much easier way. For example, I will be able to create CloudFront modules, S3 modules, uh, Kinesis modules, and Elasticsearch. This means that if you need to set up your infrastructure, you, again, don't have to be an expert in uh, Terraform, in AWS, in uh, Terraform AWS providers, in Terraform limitations. You just specify that you need Elasticsearch of this size, in this availability zone, that's it. The rest uh, of heavy lifting, which is creation of like five to 10 different resources is happening uh, without, uh, without you understanding it. You ca it's always open source and you can always contribute and you can always use this code the way you want. You can fork it, you can make your changes, uh, but at least it's it's very easy way to get started. And uh, yeah, I think that's all for me. Uh, I was told that there is a box uh, somewhere where you have to put something, but uh, as a hint, I don't know why, but a green uh, piece of paper is much bigger. <laughs> I don't know why. So thanks uh, for that, and uh, if you have any questions, I will be here uh, today and tomorrow, and you can ask me anything on Twitter and GitHub. I have some stickers actually as well, if you are into that like this. Module CF is one of my projects where you get uh, visual diagrams created in CloudCraft, you click export and you get Terraform configuration generated from these uh, visual diagrams. It is open source and uh, I have stickers. And if you want to add some new features, uh, add it into CloudCraft or to Modules TF or to any projects, just let me know. Cool, yeah. Thank you. You have a question? Uh, how is the community compared to CloudFormation, uh, Google, or Terraform? Yeah, so the question was how, uh, how, what is the difference between community, uh, Terraform, CloudFormation, and Google, and so on. Uh, the community in Terraform is built, I mean, where community is built, uh, like what's the purpose of community at all? Is to share knowledge and to get your problem fixed. Uh, as far as I know, Google, as well as CloudFormation, does not have anything like registry. So there is no single place where you can go and you can say, oh, what is the best uh, way to set up, let's say, network in Google? Uh, literally, I have no clue where to go. I can go to documentation, I can ask in different Slack channels, I can ask different people and so on and I will get 20 different results, 20 different solutions. What is the difference between uh, HashiCorp communities is that, uh, yes, of course, there are different Slack channels, mailing lists, uh, community.hashicorp.com, 
but all of these uh, discussions are uh, around something what people uh, share in central place, which is registry.terraform.io. There are about, um, about a thousand of uh, modules contributed by people, and you can just see their uh, contribution and you can easily find something uh, to talk about. There are many different uh, good communities like Slack. Uh, I can recommend uh, HangOps uh, is one. Uh, I think there are more than 1,000 of Terraform developers uh, right now. And another one is uh, uh, Sweet Ops. Sweet Ops, uh, yeah, we started it a pretty long time ago, but uh, we have about 30 people joining every, uh, every week. Yeah, every week. So we are almost reaching 1,000 of people. And the uh, work uh, which we have there is primarily support. So if you have any question about stuff which we develop, uh, you go there to a specific room and you ask question and most likely there will be people answering you. What I personally don't like with many of these communities is that uh, you ask questions and nobody answering. Right? I mean, we've been to this position many times. Uh, I'm asked uh, constantly different questions which I try to answer, but if it takes me more than a couple hours a day, then I try to to kind of get paid for that. But yeah, any other questions, please uh, let me know. We have one minute. Yep. I have one question. As it said, uh, the Terraform can be used for anything, including ordering pizza. Uh, there are many uh, different uh, tools or similar <coughs> tools that really overlap each other. What is a good practice? Which tool uh, should be used for, uh, for what? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, th so I will repeat the question. Uh, there, will, uh, there are actually a lot of tools similar to Terraform which allows to, uh, to do similar things. Uh, I mean, I use word similar because it's really similar. It's not exactly the same, it's similar, okay? And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. There, are, uh, there will be talk by uh, Paul Stack somewhere, I think later today, uh, about... Um, uh, about, I don't know actually what he's going to talk about, but uh, he is a guy who developed Terraform in about 2016, and then he moved to another company who is developing a competitor of Terraform. So I really encourage you to check his talk, uh, though I'm not sure if he will be talking about that one. Uh, in any case, uh, where Terraform shines is uh, creation of uh, infrastructure. It's not uh, going to replace your Puppet, Ansible, uh, because it's not configuration management. It's not going to go deep into each of uh, resource which you create and configure them. So it's not uh, going to replace things like uh, Packer uh, or Vagrant, which we use to create immutable images, as well as it's not going to replace Docker or Kubernetes. It's just uh, something what creates infrastructure. Infrastructure is needed for other things to be working on, like your services cannot run without network. So someone has to set up network. And this is where um, historically all of these tools were able to jump in and say, hey, we can fix network. Like uh, with Ansible, you can do everything, right? You can set up mm, literally the same amount of resources. Uh, the benefit of Terraform, though, is that it's very declarative. You are not specifying do this after this after this. Uh, though I know some companies who have invented, or invented in quotes, of course, uh, made Terraform uh, using Ansible. So think about this is that they solve problems like uh, dependencies and uh, that instances has to be created after network is uh, created using Ansible, uh, what is it, notifications or how it's called in Ansible, hooks, uh, notifications. So it looked like big monster. Um, of course, uh, that's, it is possible, as well as similar projects people do with uh, Puppet. Uh, I mean, Puppet can create different resources, so that's the way to go. No, it's, in fact, it's not, because code is not designed for that. Terraform uh, has very clear separation. Is that There is Terraform Core, there is Terraform Provider, and there is your uh, Terraform module, which manage Terraform resources. So you have this very clear separation between this, while Puppet is more like big monster with some modules, which some resources. 
so it doesn't have very clear separation. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the biggest difference. Uh, when it comes to Google, I simply don't know uh, any place uh, where I can just go and uh, get list of like preferred ways to set up networking. I mean, of course, I ha I can read documentation, I can do the heavy lift, and I can understand how networks supposed to be built in Google read a bunch of different best practices, come up with my solution. But uh, the idea of, at least to my understanding, the idea of uh, DevOps and business is that uh, you actually focus on what you're supposed to be doing. You don't have to know everything in order to sell your stuff on your website. And that's not what going to, uh, to help you with. So don't, don't try to come up with solution unless it's really important for your business. And network is unlikely to be main business for most of you guys. Yeah. Any other questions? No. But I have stickers, right? Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs>